Um, but as I was away in, um, we went to Asheville, North Carolina. Um, I went there twice and we went to Glen Rose and a couple different places. We camped at Eisenhower State Park. We, we got out in God's creation and just enjoyed the beauty of God's creation. And as I was uh, experiencing that, I was reminded of Psalm 8. And I thought about Psalm 8 and I thought, I want to preach Psalm 8. When I get back and talk about the glory of God, and specifically I've titled this a God-centered worldview, a God-centered worldview. We're looking at Psalm 8, nine verses, short little psalm, beautiful psalm that David wrote here, and he gives us a view of the world that is biblical. He gives us a view of the world that is God-centered. Now, just for a moment, before, before we continue, I just want you to think, when you look at the world, when you think about all that's going on in the world today, what comes to your mind? You don't have to say it out loud, but what's the first thing that comes to your mind? When you look at the world, what's your view of the world? Okay? David looked out at the world, and he saw the glory and the majesty of God. His, his worldview was centered on God, the creator, who is all-powerful, all-wise, all-loving, and all-good. And so he saw that. And, and one of the things that happens in this world is we experience some disorientation, we kind of lose our way. We kind of, we get confused and we get lost and we get disoriented in this world. We forget who we are and who God is. Because after God created everything good, mankind rebelled against God and sin entered the world and death entered the world and pain and suffering and brokenness entered the world. And so we've all experienced this at, at one point. I mean, think about the last time you felt disoriented, okay? Maybe it was 2020. Maybe you were one of the ones who got COVID and physically you, and mentally you just felt cloudy and foggy and disoriented from getting sick, okay? Maybe, maybe uh, we got some parents here. Maybe it's parenting and just there's a lot going on with the kids, a lot of movement, a lot of noise, a lot of activity. And maybe as a parent, you have felt overwhelmed and disoriented, right? Or maybe, maybe it's through some relational pain, something that somebody did or said to you that just wounded you deeply, and it just caught you off guard and you felt disoriented. Or maybe just some anxiety and fears that you have about your life uh, that has just made you feel disoriented. Or a traumatic event. Or uh, anybody wear contact lenses and you ever been away and you, like you lost one. Or one like you've been wearing it way too long and you should have changed it months ago. And you got these blurry contacts and you're trying to drive at night and like you're just disoriented. Like, you're like, man, this, this does not feel good. Or, or we got some older folks here, maybe some faulty hearing aids that are going out, right? And like those hearing aids, those hearing aids aren't working so well, and you're just hearing all kinds of noise, and you're just kind of trying to play it like everything, like you're understanding everything that's going on, right? And you, and you feel a bit disorientated. That feeling is terrible, that feeling is terrible, and I've felt that a number of times in my life, a, a sense of disorientation. I was reminded of a trip that my wife and I took uh, two years ago. To We went to Yosemite. We wanted to go see God's beautiful creation at Yosemite Park in, in California, but we, we decided we also wanted a little bit of city time, so we, we flew into Oakland and stayed in, in San Francisco. And so we found a great deal on a place on San Francisco, right on the bay there. Um, and, and, and so we landed, we got a rent-a-car, and it was nighttime, and we were driving around. We found the place that we were going to stay at, and this hotel was a little, there was some shady stuff happening outside. So we got there, it was dark. We had a hard time finding it. There's hills, and, and it just felt windy, and we, we show up in San Francisco, and it's June, and so there's like, you know, rainbow flags on buildings and stuff, and we're like, you know, and we're just kind of experiencing maybe a bit of a culture shock, some disorientation, 
All right, we get there, and, 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 and the, the, the hotel room was, was, you know, it was not, we did not feel safe. There, there was this shady elevator that we had to go up through. It was almost like a haunted house or something. Or, no. um, but, but then, and then, and then we had to pay for parking, like $50, just to park our rental car. car. So we went searching for a, a, more, a cheaper place, to park, a free place, right, to park our car where they wouldn't break into the window take our stuff and and uh and so we found a spot and and sure enough the next day we we totally forgot where we parked <laughs> so we were like we were all turned around lost our bearings when we got there in the san francisco and then the next day we couldn't find our car so we were scooting around on these electric scooters kindle and i this was just kindle and i and we had a blast i was having fun i was like come on let's go you know let's explore the city and like we had this, this time limit though before you know we had to get the car and she there was a little tension there like so we had to split up and divide and conquer, and and we were able to find the car eventually. Our Kendall was able to find the car. I was like, oh look at this squirrel, no, you know. I was just like having a blast. Any, anyways, that when I think of disorientation, that that's an experience where we felt very disoriented. We felt like we, we, we needed some help to locate ourselves, locate our vehicle, right? Like, okay, look, we need some peace. And when we look at this psalm, Psalm chapter 8, it is a psalm that helps orient us to who God is and his perspective of the world, and we see ourselves rightly. Okay, listen to, what Eugene, listen to what Eugene Peterson says about this psalm. He says, prayer is an orienting act, orienting act. We begin to discover who we are when we realize where we are. Disorientation is a terrible experience. If we can't locate our place, we're left in confusion and anxiety. We're also in danger for, for ap- and, for a- and apt to act desperately with disastrous consequences. If, for example, we're alongside a cliff and we don't know it, we may lose our footing or take a catastrophic fall. While praying Psalm 8, we find out where we are in some important aspects of who we are, and that's how we regain our balance and reestablish our footing. Perhaps the Lord will do that in somebody's life here today as we look at Psalm 8. Regain some balance and establish your footing as you look into Scripture and as you come before the living God and you see who he is and what he says about himself and what he says about you and find some sure footing in him, and especially through his son, Jesus Christ. And so let's read this together. Um, this is Psalm chapter 8. I'm reading from the ESV. To the choir master, according to Giddeth, a psalm of David. So we know that David wrote this psalm, okay? Um, uh, th- this, this term, Giddeth, is, I think, a musical term. And so this was a prayer song that was to be sung by the people of God. The Psalms give us, I love the Psalms for many reasons. The Psalms give us vocabulary for prayer. Sometimes we don't know how to pray as we ought to. We don't know how to voice our frustrations, our discouragement. We don't know how to voice our praise. And we need some vocabulary. We need some help in being able to do that. Okay? And so the Psalms help us with that. And the book of Psalms is the most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament. Okay? I think that's important to note. For some reason, the New Testament authors, inspired by the Holy Spirit, drew from the rich resource of the book of Psalms, all right, to highlight a Christ-centered view, to point us to Jesus, and to point us to communion with God, true communion with God. Okay, so Psalm 8, starting in verse 1. O Lord, actually, if you all would stand with me, and let's read this together. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, 
the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you should care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Father, as we look at this psalm, God, help us to see your glory, your beauty in your word and in creation, and especially in your son and through the gospel story. And help us to respond appropriately to who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here is our big idea this morning. Our God is glorious, and his glory is, can, can be seen in the world through the great things that he has made, and his work through the seemingly small and insignificant people and means. This should lead us to humility worship, and recognition of our dignity and responsibility as God's image bears. Now, first, let's start with uh, this first line and, and the last line that says, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Here's David's worldview. He saw that God's name is majestic and glorious and great, and in the world, we see his work, we see his glory put on display. He wrote in Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. And so David, I can just imagine David as a shepherd boy, sitting under the stars, looking up into the sky, singing to God, thinking about God, his creator, and, and saying, God, you are are majestic. You are glorious. You are amazing. And so David uses two names here, uh, two descriptions of God. One is his proper name, Yahweh, the proper name of the one true God, uh, as revealed to Moses in Genesis chapter 3. He uses this name, Yahweh, O oh, oh Lord, Yahweh, our Adonai. So Yahweh means the, is, is the proper name for the one true God, and the knowledge and the use of the name implies personal or covenant relationship. The name pictures God as the one who exists and causes existence. Yahweh, the great I am, the one who said, I am that I am. Okay? So, so David says, O Lord, our Lord, and Adonai means Lord or master, supervisor, one who has authority over, husband, owner, or, or the Lord. O oh Lord, O oh Yahweh, our Lord. Notice the personal description here. Our Lord is the creator God, Yahweh, the, the God of the Bible. Is he your master? Is he your Lord? And as the saints, as the people of God, we can say, yes, he is. He is our Lord. He is our God. And so David was, starts off with that in, in verse 1, and then in verse 9, it's repeated. And so it's bookend. They're on both at the very beginning of the psalm and at the end of the psalm. So we see what the psalm is about. He's talking about the majesty of God's name, the glory of God that's been put on display in the world. And this, right, this is what we're created for, by the way. We're created to glorify God. I love to ask this question when I'm out on the streets. I did this. I was uh, at, a star, at a Starbucks driving back from um, Asheville uh, last week. Um, was it last week or the week before? And I just asked the barista, you know, hey, uh, hey, Bobby. I asked the barista, um, what would you say, 
what, what do you think the meaning of life is? What, what's your purpose in life? And, and, I, and I love just hearing the responses. I, I love to ask this question as, as folks are just, as I'm, you know, at, out, you know at, a, at a grocery store, at a restaurant, and just, just to kind of get an idea of what people make out of life. When they look at their life and they look at this world, um, you know, I, I hear a lot of different answers. I'll hear answers like, you know, to be happy or to make as much money as possible or to, to be famous. Uh, one, one answer that I hear a lot is to help people, all right? And I, and I affirm, that's good, right? But, 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 but when people ask me in, re, in return, uh, when I ask them that question, and they say, well, well I don't know, what do, what do you think? Uh, what, what's, what's your purpose in life? What's your meaning in life? I say, you know, I have to start with the reference point of God, the one who made me. I believe that, that I'm here and that we're all here ultimately for the glory of God. I agree with the Westminster Catechism that, that, that answers the question, what is the chief end of mankind? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. I believe that. I believe that, that the greatest command, as Jesus said, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. We're here ultimately for God, first and foremost, for his glory, for his honor, for his pleasure, and we're also here to love our neighbor as herself, to do good to people. And God is glorified in us and through us when we display his character in loving and serving people. And the video highlighted this that we just watched. And so we're created for the glory of God. And in, in creation, when we look at the world, we see glory and we see beauty. We see majesty. God is at work. David believed in Psalm 33, verse 5. He believed that the, the one who rules, who created it all and, and holds it all together and rules over all, he believed that that God, Yahweh, is a God of, who loves righteousness and justice and that the, the earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. He believed that. Yet, Yet, what we look, we, we can also see when we look at the world, we see that something has really gone wrong. There's a problem. There is some brokenness in the world, okay? And, and now, I, the, a biblical worldview gives space. It explains, it gives us room to comprehend and understand that there is something that has gone wrong with God's good creation, and with humanity, when God created everything, he made it good, right? He saw that it was good. He said it was very good, but something went wrong. Mankind has fallen, has sinned, and fallen short of the glory of God. David Kinder says this about this psalm. He says that this psalm is an unsurpassed example of what a hymn should be celebrating as it does the glory and the grace of God, rehearsing who he is and what he has done and relating us in our world to him, all with masterly economy of words and a spirit of mingled joy in all. May we experience joy in all and wonder and who God is as we take a step back and we, we reflect on who he is and what he's done in this world. And so my first point here this morning is that God's glory is displayed through the great things that he has made. David said, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? So, so David's describing his experience of, of looking up and seeing the majesty of God, the glory of God through creation. How many stargazers do we have here? How many, how many folks love to just sit out and when, when, the, when you can see them, when you're, it's, not, it's not covered by the smog from the city, right, or overpowered by the city lights, right, when you can actually see the stars and, and, and see the bright... It's just, it's delightful to sit and, and just look like, look up and just think, man, God, you're so big. You're so great. I wonder, uh, the, the, the old hymn, How Great Thou Art. I wonder if that was inspired, it must have been, when, you know, oh Lord my God, 
When I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the roaring thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Amen. Amen. Surely the author of that old hymn was gazing upon the glory of God in creation. And I love that he takes it, the, the last, the, the, the third verse in, in, the, in, the chat, in verse 4, he takes it to the gospel story, to Christ dying for our sin and Christ returning. And, and that day when he comes back and we kneel before the Almighty and he makes all things new. I love that progression there in that hymn and, and many other hymns have that. By the way, I enjoyed when we were singing Psalm 8 during worship. All right, we're singing, oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. At one point, did y'all hear it? That There was that roaring thunder <laughs> during the song as we were singing about that, that very thing, Psalm 8, right? Did y'all hear it? My son, my 11-year-old son, looked over and he said, that was perfect timing. <laughs> that was perfect timing. I love it. It's like God was in the background with some thumbs, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's beautiful. God's, God's timing is perfect. Um, yeah, so we see the glory of God displayed through the greatness of the things that are made. And we would do well for our own souls to reflect upon this, okay? Because we get, we get so caught up in this posture, right? Or this posture, right? What, a couple years ago, I went to the doctor, just a checkup. I said, you know, I've been having these pains in my neck right here and some headaches a little bit. For real. I'm for real. And he told me, he said, well, how much time do you spend on your phone? And, 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 and he said, you know, here's some stretches. I, I can show you how to work on that. All right? This is a common issue that's happening right now. We're stuck in this position. I was talking, I was talking to my, my cousin here in, in recently. He just turned 18, and he was talking about, we were talking about this and social media and, and screen time. And he said, yeah, man, like some, some of my friends, when they hang out and they stay over the night, they wake up. Like, they wake up in this position. Like, whoa. I said, man, it's like crack. I mean, it's like, what is going on? We're stuck on these screens looking down and we miss the glory all around us in creation that God wants us to see, all right? And, and, and one of the highlights of, of this time away for me and my family is that I was more disconnected from my phone and my computer than I've been in years and it's just been good for my soul. It's orienting to me. It helps me rest and enter into rest and not be stuck in front of a screen. All right, now there are plenty of good things to, to learn and see on screens, but, but let's, let's, let's not miss seeing the glory of God in the created world that's all around us simply by taking a walk in the park. Taking a walk in the park and hearing the birds chirp and seeing the squirrels do their thing and maybe seeing some other little animals around. We, uh, I, I saw while I was away, jog, I was doing a lot of exercise, and while I was jogging, I would see deer. I saw deer a number of times, and I just love it. You know, I'm just thinking, as the deer, just jogging, pan it for the water, right? And, and I'm just delighted by looking out of the beauty and the goodness of God in creation, that's still there. Though this is a corrupted, fallen, broken world, there's a lot of darkness in the world. Yet, that darkness has not eclipsed and erased the goodness of God that is still to be seen and experienced in this world. Amen? Amen? 
right? And, and so, and though we may experience storm, personal storms in, in life, and may, though we may feel like we're surrounded by clouds of darkness and despair, the sun is still shining. Though you may not see it through the dark clouds currently, the sun is still shining. David was able to look at the world and say, God, how majestic is your name. Now, David also talked about, in, in several Psalms, you just go to chapter 13, Psalm 13, and he says, he's saying, how long, O Lord? How long must it go on like this? Right? So there's also space for this grieving and for this, like, God, something has to change. This isn't right. But even when we read those Psalms, we see David coming to this resolve, this resolve that, God, you're good. God, you're holy. God, you're sovereign. God, you will bring justice in the world. God, you will bring rescue to those who look to you and depend on you. At the end of Psalm 13, uh, verse, I think, 5 or 6, he says, But I have trusted in the steadfast love of the Lord. I have trusted in the steadfast love of the Lord. Okay, so we see God's glory displayed through the great things that he's made, right? And then we see God's glory displayed through his care for us. And I love this contrast. As David looks up and he sees the greatness of God's work in creation through the skies, um, he's struck with this thought, what is man? What is man that you are mindful of him? I mean, perhaps he just felt very, very small as he considered the galaxies, as he considered the universe, as he considered everything that God has made. And what is man? Now, the Bible asks this question. It mentions this question in a couple different places. A few times it's negative. It's, it's challenging man's place where man exalts itself higher than it ought to be, right? But this is, this is more of a positive example of what is man? Here's a positive thing here. You're mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him. Jesus, by the way, when Jesus was emphasizing why we as his followers shouldn't worry and be anxious about tomorrow, what we'll eat and what we'll drink and, and our clothing and all that, those basic things in life that we need, he said, hey, look at the birds. They're not stressed out. They're not stressed out about, man, how are we going to pay rent? We're going to get kicked out of this nest if we don't find some money. They're not stressed out about the clothes and food. Like, God is taking care of them and is going to take care of you. So seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. God cares for the details in creation. He sees the details so much so that not even one of those birds falls to the ground, as Jesus said, apart from your father's will, apart from your father not knowing it and, 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 and being aware of that. And if he cares for the birds, child of God, how much more will he care for you? and take care of you, and give you what you need through whatever circumstance you find yourself in in this life, whether it's sickness, whether it's poverty, whether it's uh, relational pain and betrayal, whether it's disorientation, and your life just feels like it's falling apart, we can trust that our lives are in the hands of the Almighty and find comfort in that. He cares for us. Now, this should also humble us, by the way, right? So sometimes we get puffed up as humanity. We think it's all about us. The, a secular worldview that excludes God makes it all about man and what man has evolved to and what man can do with all the technology that man has. Now, I will say that the technology over the last 50 years is impressive. Like, I mean, and God is the God of technology. Like, he's the one who, like, told Noah to like build the ark and gave him the resources and he used wood and tar and he built this boat, right? But then we see man using technology like in, in, in Babel, the, the Tower of Babel, building a tower up to God to, with an evil intent. 
man has used technology and used the, the resources that God has given to man to steward in ungodly, evil ways. And so, so when David sees the greatness of God in creation, he's, he's humbled and he, by, by this and he asks, what is man that you're mindful of him? And the son of man that you should care for him. Okay, so, so this helps us locate ourselves in relation to God. He is God and we're not. He has made us. We have not made ourselves. Psalm 100, right? He's made us. We're his. We belong to him. And so he cares for us. He thinks about us more than the number of sand in the seashores. All right? Now, two of our guest speakers talked about this from Psalm 139 and Psalm 40. How vast are your thoughts towards us? Like, we can't even keep track of how much God has been thinking about us. That should free us up, not the fret over, fret over our own lives, knowing that God's already thinking about us. None of it catches him by surprise. And his thoughts towards us are good thoughts. They're, they're loving, gracious, good thoughts. Thoughts of, of, that are not to harm us, but to bring about good and well-being in our lives so that we might glorify him, that we might do good to others. That should free us up. That should help us rest at night. That should keep us from overworking, fretting about our lives. What is man what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you should care for him? So David was humbled here as he looked out at the greatness of God. Now we also see in this psalm um, God's glory displayed by working through weak people. Weak people, weak and afflicted people. Humanity itself in general but also we see this theme of babies, right? We see it almost seems, it almost seems like, like, like disconnected from the psalm. Okay, what's going on here? Like he goes from, you know, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've, you have set your glory above the heavens. And then he goes into verse 2. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes, to still the enemy and the avenger. Now notice within this psalm, there is place for something gone wrong with God's good creation. There are enemies, foes, and avengers. Enemies of God. Those who would oppose his way and his reign in the world. Okay? We see that. There is injustice in the world. There is brokenness in the world. There is hatred in the world. Jesus said the love of many will grow cold in the last days, right? There's, there's a lot of brokenness in the world, and David does not deny that. But it doesn't eclipse the goodness and the glory of God that he sees in the world because God is the one who's ultimately in charge. and He's going to do something about all this brokenness. And God has chosen to display his glory through weak people. I mean, think about babies for a moment and just think about, I mean, they're beautiful. They're cute, right? They're precious. Um, Jesus quoted this in Matthew 21 on Palm Sunday as he's riding in on a donkey, not a, not a mighty war horse, but lowly, right? Riding in as a donkey. By the way, God, in, in choosing to defeat his enemies, chose to send a baby into the world, born of a virgin. Jesus came as a baby. Herod tried to kill him. Satan tried to tempt him. The Pharisees tried to stop him. And when the crowds of children and just common people were just praising him, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The religious leaders, the seemingly strong of the day, and the smart or intellect, intellectual and the theologically trained of the day, they were offended by this. They were like, do you see, do you hear what they're saying? 
And Jesus quoted Psalm 8. And he said, out of the mouth of babes comes perfected praise. Out of the mouth of babes comes perfected praise. Praise. God loves, as Paul says, to choose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. He says, for consider, brothers, not many of you were wise and according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Or to say it positively, let him who glories or boast." Boast in the Lord. Last year, we went through 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians, and this was a theme specifically of our series in 2 Corinthians, God's strength through weakness. Strength and weakness, right? Because God's glorified by working through weak people. I was encouraged by this, and I've been encouraged by this many times on Sunday morning right before I come up to preach, and I just feel weak. I feel like, David, who am I? What, what is man? Who am I to be up here to share your word with your people to handle these powerful, true, holy words and feed them to your people, explain them to your people, exhort your people to action, and extol your name while I'm doing it, worship you and enjoy you while I'm doing it? Who am I that I get to do this? The honor and the privilege of being able to do this. And so, so God uses the mouth of babies, the praise of babies. Uh, as one, um, one theologian says, the Greek translation of the Septuagint and, um, uh, rightly interprets strength as strength attributed to God in song. Strength attributed to God in song or to praise. Um, I heard um, ab about a young child of an atheist couple who once said to his parents, do you think God knows that we don't believe in him? <laughs> do you think God knows that we don't believe in him? Out of the mouth of babes comes perfected praise. I love just the raw, frank, straightforward praise of children. Sometimes our Children can say the most profound things in the simplest of ways and humble mom and dad and others who are listening. And God has just chosen to work in this way. He uses weak people. He came as a child, as a baby born in a manger. He came riding lowly on a donkey, and he, he gathered a band of brothers and sisters of people who were untrained, uneducated, outcast who seemed like they wouldn't be much in the world. And God has chosen to work through people like that. I like how the, the, the message uh, puts this. He says, uh, Eugene Peterson says, that nursing infants gurgle choruses about you. Toddlers shout songs that drown out enemy talk and silence atheist babble. Well said. Here's another commentator, a theologian that says, infants are not only wonderful illustrations of God's power, power and skill in their physical constitution, instincts, and early developed intelligence, but also in their spontaneous admiration of God's work by which they put the shame still or silence men who rail and cavil against God. I think there's a typo there. Um, who rail against God. So God's glory is displayed through him working through weak people. Does that encourage you this morning? That encourages me. Remember that Jesus said that if, if anyone's going to enter the kingdom of God, that they got to humble themselves and become like a child. If you're going to be a part of this kingdom story on the good side, on the positive, on, the, on God's side, then you need to come in humility and dependence like a little child. Trust and faith and humility, recognizing your need for him.
Jesus said, by, if you don't humble yourselves and become like children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of God in Matthew chapter 18. So also we see here that, that David says, you, when, he, when, when he, he answers the question, what is man that you are mindful of him? And of course, he's alluding back to Genesis chapter 1. Right? He's alluding back, thinking of Genesis chapter 1. He meditated on Scripture. David's worldview was shaped by Scripture, was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and saturated in prayer. He had a God-centered worldview, and he was able to see himself and humanity rightly through his God-centered worldview. This is how he answers that question. Yet, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you should care for him? Yet you made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. The word there is Elohim, okay? Now, a lot of times in the Old Testament, that's translated as God, right? Okay, now I think the ESV does a good job here translating it as spiritual beings or heavenly beings, You've made him a little lower than heavenly beings, and you've crowned him with glory and honor. You've given him dominion over the works of your hands. Okay, remember back in Genesis? God created mankind. He created a good world, and he told mankind. He blessed them. He said, be fruitful and multiply. Take dominion over the world, right? Like, and that doesn't mean abuse it doesn't mean just take the resources and waste it and abuse it and abuse people. And unfortunately, after Genesis chapter 3, that's what we see happening. We see a misuse of the stewardship, of the responsibility given to humanity. And we see terrible things. We see technology being used in terrible ways to harm people. Many people are, are very anxious about this new AI development. Perhaps you are as well. What's going to happen? Are, are computers going to rule the world, right? right? God has put humanity in the world to be image bearers of God, to, to manage, to steward, to, to rule over, to govern the world, and yet humanity has failed to do that in a way that brings God glory. We have fallen short of displaying the glory of God, and we've fallen short of doing what, what, what God is honored by in, in, in both word, deed, and in, in, in our character. And so what does God do to fix the story? What does God do to, to, to bring about a good ending? Because the Bible, a God-centered worldview, has a good ending. All right? It doesn't end on a bleak note. Sin and Satan and hell does not get the last word. Our Lord does. Our Lord Jesus. Death does not get the last word. So God sends his son into the world. And Paul quotes this. He quotes chapter 8 of Psalms. The author of Hebrews in chapter 2 quotes this psalm referring to the humanity that Jesus took on. And he lived a perfect life. And he lived in such a way that the Father designed humanity to live in doing good and reflecting God's image. And he showed us what, what God's good design is to look like. He, he became our redeemer and our rescuer. He did for humanity what we could not do for ourselves and what we have failed to do for ourselves because we are all sinful and we've fallen short of the glory of God. But we have a redeemer. And this is where we see the glory and the goodness of God put on display ultimately through his son who took on flesh and he dwelt among us. And John says, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Jesus showed us what it looks like to steward a human life well, to live for the glory of the father to do good to people. And so we see in this psalm a glimpse of Christ. Okay, Charles Spurgeon says this, for the scope and the business of this psalm seems plainly to be this, 
to display and celebrate the great love and kindness of God to mankind, not only in creation, but especially in his redemption by Jesus Christ, whom as he was a man, he advanced to the honor and dominion here mentioned that he might carry, out, carry on his great and glorious work. So Christ is the principal subject of this psalm, and it is interpreted of him by both our Lord himself and by his holy apostle. And so Jesus came, and he brought redemption to us who believe. He's made us new creations in Christ Jesus. And so let's close on a couple points of application here. First, lose yourself in the greatness of God's story. To use Jesus' words, what good would it be for a man to gain the whole world but lose or forfeit his own soul, right? We don't want that. We don't want the world. If you want to save your life, you're going to have to lose your life. Let it be wrapped up and caught up in God and who he is surrendered to his will, surrendered for his glory. Only then and then only will you find true life and experience fullness of life. We're made to live wholeheartedly for God. Sometimes we don't rest well. This is one of the things that, that stuck, stuck out to me on this sabbatical. Sometimes we don't rest well because we're not living wholeheartedly. We're designed to live wholeheartedly, to, to put our all into what God's given us in this life. And it helps us to rest well when it's time to rest, right? Um, so lose yourself in the greatness of God and his great story. You're a part of a story that is much greater than yourself. You and I are a part of, of a story that is much greater than ourself, Lean on God's loving care, okay? God cares for us. Though he's great and glorious and he's, and he's made everything, he cares for you. He hasn't forgotten you. He's not done with you. He's going to finish what he started in you. Paul was confident of this about the Philippian church, and the church that the, the people of God that he ministered to, he was confident that he who began a good work in them would complete it unto the day of Christ Jesus. I'm confident of that for you, saints, that God will finish what he started in you. And I've been so encouraged to hear what God's been doing in, in your lives while I've been away. I've been so encouraged that the church building has not burnt down or Church family hasn't broken up and many other things. I've been so encouraged that, that God is working in your lives, whether I'm here or not. God's working. God's everywhere, and he's always with his people. And lastly, um, locate yourself in God's story. So we, we are to recognize our honorable place in God's story given, given to humanity. And, and this should dignify us. When we look at people, we should see them as image bearers of God that have value because they're made in the image of God. We're more valuable than cats and dogs and birds and flowers and, and other things in this world. We're valuable because we bear the image of God. Life, human life is valuable to God. And so we are to live honorable lives. We are to steward our lives and resources well. Don't squander your resources. Don't squander your time. Don't neglect your relationships. See people through God's eyes, through the lens of Scripture, as those who are made in the image of God, who bear the image of God, people for whom Jesus has died. Amen? Amen? And so let us stand in all of God's work, praise him for who he is and what he's done, and be humble before him as we faithfully carry out our God-given stewardship in this world.